welcome to some of the greatest people <laughs> on planet Earth, and that's people that love the Word of God. CSTI students, welcome back now to lesson number six of the Book of Acts, part two. And we are moving slowly, slowly from chapter 13 through chapter 28. And uh, now in lesson number six, we're at chapter 14. And hopefully today we can also get through chapter 15. But uh, we mentioned in our last presentation how that we begin with Paul's and Barnabas missionary journey uh, that uh, took them from the city of Antioch. And then from Antioch, they went to Cyprus. And from Cyprus, they went to Perga. And to Perga, they went to Antioch of Pisidia. And then to Iconium. And to Lystra. And then to Derby. And then we watched, uh, we will watch the path go backwards. And uh, then we'll end up finally back in, in uh, Antioch for a final wrap-up. So, uh, what did Paul and Barnabas do uh, here in Antioch, <laughs> they dust their feet off, is what we just finished in chapter number 13, uh, when that they would be rejected, basically run out of the city, and they're going to go to Iconium, and, uh, and there they're going to preach the word of God in Iconium. So that sets the stage then for chapter 14. And uh, now it happened in Iconium that they went together into the synagogue of the Jews, as was customary, that uh, generally they would go. They already had a platform built where they could enter in and be received and usually be able to speak a bit. And uh, so there they come to Iconium and so spake to a great multitude, both of Jew Jews and of the uh, Greeks. So we have again the God-fearing Greeks that are there to hear the Word of God. But the unbelieving Jews, here we go with the story continued, how that we're going to have a Jewish resistance in this, in this infant uh, Christian sect emerging out of Judaism. The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by the hands of Paul and Barnabas. But the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, part with the apostles. So now we have the apostles... And uh, rather than naming Paul and Barnabas, it appears Paul and Barnabas are apostles uh, recognized by the early church. So the word apost apostle means one's sent. That's literally what uh, apostolio means in the Greek text. And one's sent. So, of course, Paul and Barnabas are ones sent, and they are considered apostles. And uh, then against them are what's described here as the Jews, in opposition, the Jews. Verse number 5, when a violent attempt was made by the Gentiles and Jews and their rulers to abuse and stone the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and to Derbe into the cities of Lyconia and uh, into the surrounding region. And there they preached the gospel. So on to verse number 8. Then Lystra, a, a certain man without strength in his feet, was sitting in a cripple uh, from his mother's womb. He had never walked. This man heard Paul preaching. Paul observed him intently. And seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now when the, when the people saw that Paul had, what he had done, they raised their voices saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. But Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. 
Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in the front of their city, brought oxen and garlands into the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? <clears throat> we also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. So now witness how that there is a shift in the preaching. How that we have, rather than preaching about Israel, preaching about Egypt, the, the uh, deliverance from the slavery, the uh, Israel's history, we now have begun to preach about a living God who made the heaven, made the earth, made the sea, and made the things that are in them. So we are appealing more to a Greek and a Hellenistic audience that would have an understanding of the creation that they can see and have little knowledge about the, about the uh, history of Israel. And, and Paul says we are men of the same nature as you. Uh, we have this nature. We can understand our nature. We can understand what it is to be a human being. And uh, out of this understanding of the nature that governs us, that shapes us, we can sense that we have a creator, a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the seas that are in them. So we see this as a means of Paul's testimony. We watch it unfold in particular in the book of Romans. I encourage you to bounce over there and see how that Paul is going to describe how that there's a testimony for all human beings and that being the creation. And that out of creation, we can either worship the Creator, or we can, as creatures, worship the things created, turning our attention to worthless things and then even to worthless idols. And you can actually see the path of degradation there in Romans chapter 1, how a society, a, a, a sociological movement towards uh, idolatry away from God, which of course is the story of the secular movement that we have witnessed uh, much in our culture. However, everybody still has the same testimony that truly can't be ignored of creation, even though science has tried to ignore it through the power of evolution and making that uh, the, the story of creation, which of course we know by biblical text that there's one God who is the creator of all, and uh, he's the living God that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he is good. He gives rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, fulfilling our hearts with food and gladness. And so we have a good God and there's a world that testifies about the goodness of our God as Paul describes it being represented in heaven uh, from rain, rain from heaven, and in the seasons that give us fruit and fill us with food and with gladness, giving credit to God. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Uh, so Paul has preached this message to these people that are obviously heathen, that are worshipers according to Romanism and Greek mythology, and uh, Zeus and, and uh, Hermes, they are being called. Uh, but the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and uh, having persuaded the multitude... <laughs> They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. I mean, uh, these tiny little sentences could be unpacked into entire chapters of a book. 
and we just get a glimpse of suddenly, uh, man, P Paul preaches an amazing message. Look at the length of time given to the message that Paul's preached and how scant then the historical detail is of what happens. Uh, that the multitudes barely stop sacrificing to them. And then the Jews come from Antioch and Iconium. And how long did that take for that to happen and, and persuades the multitudes, somehow get the attention of the multitudes. And they end up stoning Paul and dragging him out of the city, expecting him to be dead. However, the disciples then gathered around Paul and uh, he rose up and went back into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel, it didn't stop them from preaching. Uh, when they had preached the gospel in that city, they made disciples and they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. And so uh, they've made some disciples in Derby, and then they backtrack to Lystra, Iconium, and to Antioch of Pisidia. And what are they doing? They are strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying we must through many tribulations enter into the kingdom of God. We're not discounting these tribulations. We are accepting and embracing them. So when they had appointed elders in every church, it feels to me like this is one of the main reasons for returning to these communities was to appoint elders in every church with prayer and fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So they commissioned them into this ministry. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came back to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, uh, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch when they were, uh, had, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work uh, which now they had completed. And uh, now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that they had opened the door to the Gentiles. So we watched the Gentile mission uh, growing, developing, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. And so by a quick review in terms of questions, where did Paul and Barnabas speak? And uh, the answer is, again, in the synagogue in chapter 14, verse number 1, they start in Iconium in the synagogue. And what's the result of their speaking? A great multitude of Jews and, and the Greeks believed. Unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles who poisoned their mind. And the Lord confirmed the word. God was supportive of the ministry of Paul and Barnabas as we see the signs and the wonders. And the city was divided, part of the Jews, part of the, uh, with the apostles. Of course, that's referencing Paul and Barnabas. And so, uh, why did they leave Iconium? Well, an attempt was made to stone them. Of course, stoning would be a Jewish type of a practice. That's what was in the Mosaic Law. Of course, it was practiced in other cultures as well, but... It was embraced in the Jewish uh, culture and Torah to stone these that would present uh, what the unbelieving Jews considered to be false doctrine. So an attempt is made to stone them and uh, that they leave Iconium. And uh, how, how was the miracle of healing that occurred in Lystra similar to that in the book of Acts chapter 3? Well, by comparison, when, when Peter is being used, Peter and John are being used to heal the man from mother's womb. Likewise, Paul is being used to heal a man crippled from, from mother's womb. And uh, we see very similar comparisons to the ministry of Peter in Acts chapter 3 to the ministry of Paul in Acts chapter 14. So once again, we see... Uh, Paul standing on the shoulders of Peter as we watch him emerge as the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, of course, the apostle to the Jews. Why did the people of Lystra want to worship Barnabas and Paul? Well, the people saw that Paul had done what he had done and thought that they were gods, thought they were deity. And so... Oh, what did the people of Lystra call Barnabas and Paul? Well, they called Barnabas Judah, Jupiter, and they called Paul Mercurius or Hermes uh, because he was the chief speaker. 
What phrase indicates that Barnabas and Paul refused to receive worship? Well, uh, we also are men of same nature. We have this human nature that you have. What did the Jews from Antioch and Iconium persuade the people of Lystra to do to Paul? Well, let's stone them. And they did drag them out of the city uh, there in Lystra. And they stoned, tried to do it earlier, and now they get the job done. And what does Paul do? Well, he rises back up and goes right back into the city of Lystra. And uh, so where did Paul go the next day? Well, he left there and went to Derby. He departed with Barnabas to Derby, and they preach and they teach. Why did they return again to Lystra? where they were stoned, and then to Iconium where they were assaulted and attempted been stoned, and Antioch where they had been expelled, and where they got good motive, they are going to return eventually to Antioch where they're going to preach this uh, results of their, give the re- report of the results, but we have them going back to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, number one, to strengthen the soul of the disciples, number two, to exhort them to continue in the faith, and three, uh, to appoint elders. And again, I mentioned how the appointing of elders is so important. After preaching again in, in Perga, they sailed back to Antioch, and when they got back to Antioch, they reported all that God had done and how they had opened doors for the Gentiles, and that now... They're giving the good report of their missionary journey, their first missionary journey uh, through Asia Minor. Let's go on now to chapter number 15. And so now, as we move into Acts 15, of course, we have watched chapter 13 and 14 give us the first missionary journey that demonstrates a few things. It's going to show us of the rising Jewish resistance against this infant Christian sect that's emerged in Judaism. It demonstrates Christianity has come out of Judaism. It's not an independent, standalone, upshoot religion in Roman Empire. It is a natural, ordained, biblical upshoot, outshoot, outgrowth of Judaism. But we watch the increasing Jewish resistance Uh, as is demonstrated in that first missionary journey. We watch also the natural growth of the church. How that we would go into the synagogues, preach in the synagogues, reach not only the Jewish people, but the God-fears, and then even beyond, as then we watch the preaching shift in, in that first missionary journey from a Jewish perspective, where we primarily talked about the Israel's history and the perspective of Judaism. And, and we shifted in Paul's preaching to a more Hellenized Gentile type of a sermon that would talk about creation, not making an appeal based upon the Jewish traditions and the prophets. And uh, we're going to watch now this continue moving into the future, but we, we're seeing the foundation for this here in chapter 13, chapter 14. So uh, here we've, in, in our sixth lesson together, we have just talked about uh, the second part of that missionary journey, and now to one of the most important chapters in the book of Acts. Seems like all of them are like major important, but anyway, uh, chapter 15 is bringing the Gentile mission right into focus, and we're going to have to deal with this Gentile mission, so let's see how the circumstances are going to e- evolve. So chapter 15, verse number 1, I encourage you to go to your Bibles, follow along with us. Uh, we do have, of course, the study notes there in, in your notes, but and we'll get to those, but Certain men came from down from Judea. Uh, when it says down, it means by in terms of elevation. Jerusalem is 5,000 feet or so above sea level, 4,000 feet. And uh, we're going to descend down, even though it's significantly to the north. Uh, we're going northward from Jerusalem up to Antioch. And uh, But we're going to descend from the heights of the mountains of Jerusalem down to 
basically sea level elevation. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So our discussion here in chapter 15 is salvation. Underscore that, put it into your thinking, we're talking about salvation. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, can you imagine what that was like? They determined that Paul and Barnabas, so who's the they? These men that came down from Judea, determined that Paul and Barnabas and other certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles, to the elders, and we're going to have to resolve this question with the leadership of the church. And again, why? Well, because that's where uh, the uh, real headquarters of the church is, the, the nerve center for the church, the, the uh, place where the apostles were gathered together uh, there in Jerusalem. So being on their way uh, by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to come to the brethren. So we're just kind of bolstering our report here. Uh, when we're going to get back to Jerusalem, we're going to have more people saying, yes, 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 a Gentile mission needs to be supported and embraced, and they caused great joy of the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the elders and the apostles, and uh, they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees. Now, who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees are the strict adherents to the Mosaic law. They are considered uh, very zealous for the law. Uh, the, the major population of the Pharisees, the concentration of Pharisaic population, lived around Galilee, meaning that they were not the strong, strong elite power brokers of Judaism. The power brokers were the Sadducees that held the priesthood in Jerusalem and had negotiated deals with Roman in order to maintain their power, the Sadducees. Uh, and of course, they don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. But the Pharisees, they're... Their population was strongly concentrated around the Sea of Galilee, but of course they were much infiltrated throughout all of Judaism. Uh, but anyway, we have a sect of the Pharisees, the strict adherents, the zealous people for the Mosaic Law. They, they, uh, some of the sect of the Pharisees, Pharisees who had believed, they had come into this new sect of could be called Christianity. Uh, it, at this time in Jerusalem, it was called the Way. And so the people of the Way, the Pharisees believed, they rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them, these Gentiles, and command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter. And so what is the matter? And this is the major discussion here. The matter is the Gentile mission. So there's four things we're going to bear out. Number one is the Gentile mission is God's ordained plan for the humankind. All humans in the intent and mind of God is to save them. Save all human humans. So... We'll get around to Paul's sermon there in Athens when he preaches that all men everywhere are commanded now to repent. Once God winked at ignorance, but now he wants everybody to repent. God's ordained plan for everybody is for them to be saved. It's the mission of God for the Gentile and the Jew, all humanity. Uh, it's, the Gentile mission, therefore, was also an ordained plan for the Messiah. The Gentile mission was the ordained plan for the church, that the church would be then the instrument to reach the Gentiles. And so we need to fourthly discuss the appropriate human alignment to God's plan. God's ordained plan for the human, for the Messiah, for the church involved the Gentile mission, so we need to be aligned to this 
program of God. So let's first of all discuss God's ordained plan for the human because God did not order the human to sin, but God ordered a plan in case the human did sin. As we can notice here in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, before Adam and Eve are ever expelled from the garden, that God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and... Uh, The seed of the woman will bruise your head, Mr. Serpent, and he shall bruise your heel. It's a beautiful portrait of a ninja kick where the heel of Messiah is going to kick the head of the serpent and the serpent takes a bruise to the head while the Messiah will take a bruise to the heel. And of course, we can ask ourselves, when was the Messiah bruised to the heel? Figuratively speaking, and he's bruised to the heel uh, in the crucifixion. When Jesus dies on the cross, the the beauty is that he's given a head kick, <laughs> ninja kick, and to the head of the serpent. So this is God's plan literally from the foundation of the world. As recorded in Revelation 13 and 8, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. As we also see Peter writing about because of the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish, without spot, it was, he was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, has been manifest to us in the last days, Peter would say. I've seen him, I've met him, I know him, but before the foundation of the world, it was foreordained that he would die, that he would be Messiah for the salvation of all humankind, so that the Gentiles could come to the light of God and kings to the brightness of his rising as is also beautifully prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9, that nevertheless gloom will not be upon uh, who is distressed, and when he at first he lightly esteemed in the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, afterward, incidentally, that's the areas of Galilee, afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in the Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee! of the Gentiles. You remember in particular Jesus going to the Decapolis? What did he do there? Well, he entered into the place where they were feeding swine. Of course, swine would be the unclean. Uh, It was an unclean enterprise. And there Jesus cast those demons into the swine that ran off the cliff into the Sea of Galilee, basically driving the forces of evil back to where they had come from in the Jewish mind, as we would mentioned in an earlier discussion. But anyway, the people who walked in darkness, verse number 2, have seen a great light. Here's the prophecy that these in darkness, the Gentiles, will see the great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. Going on to verse 6, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and government will be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace that we witness how God's ordained plan to save everybody would include an ordained plan for the Messiah, that there would be a Messiah born. And of course, we would see the Messiah as the light to the Gentiles. That Messiah would be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Isaiah 42 and verse number 6 says, I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, a light to the Gentiles. Jesus, the covenant to the people, the light to the Gentiles in 49 and 6, uh, saying it again, I gave you, I give you as a light to the Gentiles, that the Gentiles can have the light, see the light, and be able to find salvation. That you, speaking of Messiah, should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And so when Simeon that day comes into the temple, having been promised that he would see the Messiah. Lord, now you're letting your servant Simeon depart in peace according to your words for mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared before the face of not just the Jewish people, not just Israel, but the face of all peoples. 
It, uh, so the Gentile mission is a part and function of the mission of Messiah. That he would be a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. And the glory of your people Israel. So we watch this continue to unfold then into the ordained plan for the church. That in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 that he himself, our peace, speaking of Jesus who made made both one, has broken down the middle wall petition, speaking about the separating wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. He abolished that wall in his flesh, the hatred, the enmity that was a part of that separating wall. It's been torn down. That is the, co- the law of the commandments containing uh, the ordinances so as to create in himself, inside Jesus Christ, one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the hatred, the enmity. He blended together the Jews and the Gentiles into the church, into this one place, into a place of peace, having torn down the middle wall partition. Going on to chapter 3, that by the revelation he made known to me the mystery. So Paul speaks about this as a mystery. Uh, In our thinking and English mindset, mystery is something that's hidden. In the Greek text, it's the Greek word mysterion, and it means revealed. It's been revealed. Once hidden, now revealed. And uh, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge about this mystery of Christ, which in other, uh, in other ages was not made known to the sons of man, but now has been revealed by the Spirit and uh, to, to His holy apostles and prophets that the Gentiles, praise God, can be joint heirs, fellow heirs in the same body. One body partakers of the promise of God. And so we have the mission of, of the Gentiles as a function of the church, the promise of Christ through the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 9, Having made known to us the mystery of His will according to the good pleasure that He purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, meaning Paul speaking about now, the church age, He may gather together into one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, everything being gathered together in Him, fulfilling again this ordained plan for the church. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, chapter 3, verse number 14 and 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. And so now we see it as God's ordained plan, the ordained plan for the Messiah, for the church. And can we now be brought into alignment with God's ordained plan? So uh, we look into the book of Matthew and we see the Messiah, Jesus, has clarity as to this Gentile mission. Because uh, uh, Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he went on to Galilee. He left Nazareth, came to live in the land in that city of Zebulun and Naphtali, around the sea in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions there of Zebulun and Naphtali, fulfilling the prophecies that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, prophesying that the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, uh, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen great light. And upon these that sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has dawned. So from that time, Jesus began to preach and pray and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We watch Jesus at work in Gentile mission, but when it goes to the Jewish people, The apostles, the disciples, they can't quite get it because Jesus sent out the twelve and commanded them, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't enter into the city of the Samaritans. Why not? Because you can't get this. 
you have a mindset that's Jewish only and I want to apply the principles of the kingdom into the environment that you're prepared to receive even though I'm working on you. He says, I've got in my ministry to go through Samaria, which he did, and he met the woman at the well. And of course, we have a revival in Samaria. There's great joy in the city. Jesus stayed a couple days there, pouring the foundation, what's going to come in Acts chapter 8, starting in John chapter 4. But Messiah understood his mission. Jesus went on to a centurion and preached to him. And the centurion's servant was healed that hour. We go on to the region of Tyre and Sidon where Jesus is going to deliver a woman, a daughter that's grievously vexed by the devil. And finally the disciples are ready to receive the mission when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations, not just of the Jews, but of all the nations. Go and make disciples. So using Matthew as an example, we see the disciples transitioning from a closed mindset about the Gentile mission. They're not aligned with the Gentile mission perspective idea whatsoever, but uh, Jesus has been working on them till finally he tells them, you guys really don't get it, but I want you to go to the whole world, to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That was the mandate. Every creature. Make disciples of all the nations. Nations being uh, the Greek word ethne, from where we get the word ethnicity. So go preach to all the ethnicities uh, that they can be baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we see this Gentile mission being processed when Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2. How the uh, fulfilling Joel's prophecy, I'll pour my spirit out upon all flesh, all flesh. And uh, then in uh, chapter 2, verse 39, the promises to you, of course, Acts 2, 38, repent, be baptized, you'll receive the Holy Ghost. The promises to you and to your children and to all those who are far off. Peter seems to get it while he's under the anointing and inspiration of the Holy Spirit preaching the word of God, but he didn't get it in his own personal life. Because, of course, Acts 10 is when he gets the vision uh, of the sheep being let down, when that he is then commissioned by the Spirit, the interpretation of the vision to go to Cornelius and preach. And then we discover in the book of Galatians that Paul has to confront him publicly and say, listen, man, you are a Jew living like the Gentiles until you get up here under the peer pressure and you are now acting like a Jew and you need to, uh, you need to be the example you need to be. I'm telling you, Paul, just you can go over there in Galatians and read about Paul telling Simon Peter, you need to fully be converted, that you haven't yet completely aligned to this Gentile mission. Uh, and so that's recorded in the book of Galatians. Uh, yet it was intended, of course, in the mind of God to be witnesses for the church to grow from Jerusalem, Judea, all Samaria, and then to the end of the earth. The Gentile mission to be embraced, received, and then uh, a, a part of this early church. We're watching the early church deal with this problem in Acts chapter number 15. And going on now, we pick back up at verse number 6. The apostles and the elders came together to consider the matter. And they, there was much dispute. Peter, the voice from past, the apostle to the Jews, rose up and said, Men and brethren, uh, let's do a quick review. Uh, you know that a good time ago, God chose among us, chose me, uh, that my mouth should be used to go to the Gentiles, that the Gentiles could hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart and acknowledge them by giving them the Holy Ghost, because just as he did with us, because we heard them speaking in tongues, is the witness there from Acts 10. And he made no distinction. There's no wall of separation, no distinction between us and them. Uh, he has purified their hearts by faith. So the apostles are embracing this doctrine 
that is extremely important that we are not justified by the works. We're not justified by Moses. We're not justified by the law. We're justified by faith in God, which then is faith in Jesus Christ, in the mission of Jesus, in the purpose of, of Jesus, in the accomplishment of Jesus, ultimately in the resurrection of Jesus. By faith, when we embrace and believe, of course, that faith, the five pieces of faith we'll get into and see how that it impacts into lifestyle. But anyway, now therefore, why do you try test God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which is neither, neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. Again, what's the point here of chapter number 15? It's salvation. Salvation by the grace, not works, but by grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the like manner as they. They be saved like we're saved. We get saved like they're saved. No walls of separation separating us. And when all the multitude kept silent and now is listening to Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles, again, we're watching Barnabas in the lead role in chapter 15. He's mentioned first, Barnabas and Paul declaring the miracles and the wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James, who of course is the brother to Jesus, answers saying, men and brethren, listen to me, here comes a long, lengthy, important speech in the book of Acts, chapter number 15. Sim, Simon, or in some texts it's recorded as Simeon. No, <clears throat> it's not mentioned as Peter. We're shifting the focus from Peter. Now it's being pointed upon eventually Paul, but to get there, we're doing this little handshake we have Barnabas and Paul previously mentioned. Now we don't talk about Peter. We talk about Simon or Simeon as is in some of the references. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Why is that so important? That's fulfilling prophecy. And this is the words of which the prophets agree, just like it is written. That I will return. I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. David had a promise that there would be a people for his name. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that, that the rest of hu humankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So the Lord does all these things. And uh, that is prophesying from, from Amos chapter number 9. That Israel will be restored. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. So what's the tabernacle of David? Well, we had uh, the tabernacle of Moses uh, that had been set up in Shiloh. Now David is the one responsible to relocate the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David, Zion, city of Jerusalem. And he sets it up into the tabernacle of David where it's going to be maintained until the temple is built by Solomon. So until we have the building of the temple of Solomon, we have the tabernacle of David. And it's primarily a tabernacle that would house this Ark of the Covenant and be known for being a place of praise and worship. And it's been fallen down. It's repairs and repair its damages. It's going to be raised back up and rebuilt it as the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. There's the prophecy. Amos makes the prophecy that the Lord says He's going to do this thing and uh, so continuing on with James' sermon, known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble these among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, any pollutions of idolatry. Now, that's a huge concept. Idolatry was wrong, but also he says anything that's connected to idolatry, the pollutions of idolatry. They need to abstain from, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had 
been uh, preached throughout many gener- generations. Uh, those who preach him in every city, he's still read in the in the synagogues. We're not discrediting Moses. We're talking about the Gentile mission that has now been uh, expanded, and the Gentiles are believed. So it, pl- it pleased the apostles and elders. The whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Paul's name first now, namely Judas. So we watch the flip in Acts chapter number 15. From Barnabas being in the lead to Paul being in the lead, namely Judas was the one named, uh, also named Barnabas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter. So here is recorded in Acts 15, the actual letter that's going to be read uh, by them, the elders, the apostles, the brethren, to the brethren who are in the in the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, since we have heard that some of you went out, have been troubled. But well, here's the letter: you've been troubled with the words unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law. To whom we gave no such commandment. That didn't come from us. It seemed good to us, being assembled in one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas. So we're introducing Silas, who of course is going to be central in the upcoming missionary journeys. Paul and Silas you've heard of. Uh, Silas, who will also report the same things by the word of mouth. For it seemed good to, uh, to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden. I love the phrase, seem good to the Holy Spirit and to us. We're connected. Holy Spirit and to us. A double witness. Uh, no greater burden upon you than these necessary things that you abstain from things offered to idols. Again, the pollutions of idolatry. Associations with idolatry. And then secondly, from blood. Then from things strangled. And then fourthly, from sexual immorality. Uh, if you keep yourself from these things, you will do well, fare well. And so uh, then they were sent off. They came to Antioch and they gathered the multitude together. And they read. And when they heard, read this, they rejoiced over it, the encouragement. And Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there with them a time, they were sent back with greetings uh, to the apostles, uh, to the brethren, to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there in Antioch. So we're hanging on to Silas. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also and then after some days Paul said to Barnabas let us go back and visit the brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing and Paul and Barnabas was determined to take with them John Mark and Paul insisted no we'll get into this next time some Uh, and so the contention became so great that Paul and Barnabas kind of divide uh, themselves, their energies Paul takes Silas and departs being commended by the brethren to go by the grace of God and he went throughout Syria and Cilicia strengthening the churches so we're wrapping up chapter number 15 noticing now Barnabas is going to go off to the side a bit the attention comes to Paul and we are uh, walking rapidly through chapter 15 and we continue then with this incredible work of missionary endeavor that's going to go on in chapter number 16 next session going to be good thank you for joining me as we've gone through chapter 14 and chapter 15 god bless you Mm -hmm.